Good evening again, UT Baptist Church, our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, this is study number three in the book of Romans, the second chapter, uh, on the 15th day of July. And so we encourage you to find your Bibles. And while you do that, we do a little bit of a review of some things we've already talked about. And you know, to have now a better display of uh, the, the epistles of Paul. You know, Paul probably wrote as far as we know, this book of Romans on his third missionary journey, which you can see right over there, excuse me, right there. And so he wrote this book to them, anticipating to come and see them, as we've talked about before. And then as we also discussed, in order to study the Bible properly, you need to see it correctly. And so here we see some things that we've talked about that we will continue to refer to as we study the different passages of Scripture. All passages of Scripture need to be looked at uh, through this, this lens here of seeing uh, the chronology, uh, when it happened, what else was going on in the history of that time, the characters who wrote it and who it was written to, uh, the communication style, whether it was a just history lesson, whether it was a poetry with a lot of imagery and symbolism in it, whether it was a, a, a treatise or a doctrinal study trying to convey certain truths. So those are the kind of things we need to understand, know about, and also the uh, different uh, particular words that would be used as things, the time changes, the word usage changes, means different things to different people. The context, again, exactly what was going on to the particular people that were being written to or, or going around the writer himself at that time. And then the content, exactly what it is, it's trying to be said. Make sure we understand that correctly. And then comparison. We understand that all scripture given by God is uh, certainly is consistent. There is no conflict. And so when you see one verse that seems to say something different than another verse, as you look at many verses, you find the true meaning of it, or perhaps as you look in the, in the context of where it's being said, it will give you a better understanding. So again, never read a verse all by itself without a before the verses and after the verse to see, again, totally what the context would be. And then also that certainly throughout the Bible, what we call the uh, red ribbon or the scarlet thread is somehow or another, every passage of scripture refers to Christ. It's sometimes very difficult to dig that up, but uh, sometimes real obvious, but it does because Jesus is the answer for all of our problems. And Jesus was God's plan uh, for mankind to be saved. And then finally, because of all these things that Christ has done for us and all the directions we have, uh, we know that there are some challenges to our lives, some changes we need to make as sinful people. We need to continue uh, to try to improve, try to draw closer to him in all that we do. And so those are the things we need to look at uh, as we study these passages. Now, we've done Romans 1, and, and we've gone to the points to ponder there. We've gone over those, and we've done the rest of the chapter of Romans 1, the points to ponder there. And now we are embarking on Romans chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 16. So uh, again, a little bit more of a review before we dive right into this chapter. First thing all, that uh, Paul has explained at the end of chapter 1 that all mankind has the same general revelation of God, uh, and so he's without excuse and knows about how he should live. Uh, and But also, sin has made all man depraved, and he's subject to judgment because of that. He's disobedient to God. Uh, God created him and perfect man in a perfect world with the ability to choose to follow or not follow God. And of course, man chose poorly. Even though he was influenced by Satan to do so, man still had uh, the responsibility to choose correctly instead of incorrectly, and he did not. And because of that, mankind ever since has, has been cursed with the, the penalty of sin. And each of us, again, uh, do that, choose to do that individually as well as the general a sentence on mankind. So let's look at chapter verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2 of the book of Romans, and we'll make some comments on that. It says, You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? So here we go. When it talks about the you here, 
Uh, it couldn't apply to the Jews or the Gentiles. Remember, uh, this church in Rome was composed of both. Uh, but here at this point in time, uh, sometimes they'll talk more directly to the Jews, sometimes more directly to the Gentiles. But this, this could cover anybody. And so uh, it seems to be more aimed perhaps at the Jews at this moment because they tend to be the ones condemning the Gentile people for not being a Jew and not following the laws that they had and so forth. And when it says, therefore, that refers back to the fact in chapter 1 that all mankind, again, is guilty of sin that we already talked about. And it's hypocritical, certainly, to point out the sin in somebody else's life when you're doing the very same thing. Why would you think you would be excused from the judgment that, they, that would happen to them that you're saying would happen? And so, uh, certainly don't commit the same kind of sin that you're pointing out. Now, when we talk about judgment, ultimately God is the, is the, is the ultimate judge of all mankind. But in many places in the Bible, he has listed the Ten Commandments and throughout Paul's writings and things Jesus said. He, there are sins that are, are directly pointed out, things you should not do. And so when you see somebody doing that, it's not wrong to tell them they're, they're sinful because you're trying to get them on the right path of God and obey God. So it's not wrong to point out a sin, but certainly to point it out and then be doing the very same thing is very hypocritical because you will be judged for the same uh, in the same way that those people would be judged. You, you have no excuse uh, if you violate the same violations other people do. Uh, it's just like the law today. Everybody is subject to the law. Uh, if somebody's doing something wrong, you try and do the same thing and you turn them into the law, to law enforcement, and they, they refer back to you and say, well, if they do the same thing, well, certainly you would be arrested also. So, so, so we're all guilty. So when you point out something somebody else is doing wrong, certainly don't be doing the very same thing. That's very much a hypocrite. And of course, this is what many Christians are being accused of today. Uh, you say you do not do this, but you're doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, percentages of, uh, you look at sins in, in Christians and non-Christians, it seems like the same percentage of people in, in both groups do commit the same sort of sins that are being pointed out. And so unfortunately, we as Christians have not been a very good example. Uh, in terms of that. Not wrong to point out errors and sin, but sure it's wrong to be doing the same thing as you pointed out. All right, verses four through five. It says, or, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment shall be revealed. This passage reminds me a little bit of the story of the, the servant who owed his master a great deal of money, and then he could not pay it, I mean, a huge amount of money, and so he went to the master and begged for, for time, begged for forgiveness uh, and tolerance of the debt that he owed, and, and the master completely forgave everything, I mean, a huge amount of money. And so, but instead of being thankful for that and appreciating that, and he goes out and finds a, somebody who owes him a little bit of money and puts him in jail and beats him and all this kind of stuff. And so when we point out sins to other people, our, our goal is to help them be reconciled to God even as we have been. We need to always appreciate the salvation that we have received because it was the kindness of God. It was the gift of God. It's not something he needed to do, had to do, or that we deserve. But because of who God is, because of his, his characteristics, because of his attributes, uh, he... He did that for us. And our desire here, since we have received such great salvation, ought to be to encourage others to do the same. And we need to repent when we don't appreciate what God has done, and certainly we need to repent of our lack of effort to help other people to be reconciled to him. Because true, that is uh, what we need to be doing. And, and there's a you know an economical point to this thing. The more people are right with God, the easier it is to live in this world, the more beneficial it is for, for us as individuals. Uh, because they're doing what is right. What a world it would be if we didn't have to worry about somebody stealing stuff from us or hurting stuff from us or telling lies about us or treating us perfectly honest all the time. What a world that would be. Well, we would hope that a more Christian world would be like that. Not always that way, but we, we hope it would be. And it could be if people were to respond correctly. All right, verses 6 now through 11. So the God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. 
There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Now, God can be considered racist in this one aspect. He is for the human race, each and every one of us. Red, yellow, black, and white, he loves all of us. Jews or Gentiles, he loves all of us. And his desire is for all of us to be blessed. But also, uh, he will judge us. Red, yellow, black, or white, uh, Jew or Gentile, for our actions and for our uh, belief in Christ or not, uh, our disbelief in Christ. What we see in our world today is it, it, so strange because of the praise mind of man, he can't see things straightly. Uh, wrong is wrong. I don't care who does it, what color they do it. And, and, and so uh, it's, it's just crazy. But God says, I will judge perfectly. Uh, it depends on your response to me, your obedience to my commands, and your acceptance of Christ. So it doesn't make any difference who you are. You will not get a pass. Uh, the human race is subject to judgment. And there is glory, peace, and honor before God for those who follow him, even in, in the world. Uh, the world is in turmoil, but you can still have a peace in mind and know that God sees all. God will ultimately judge all properly. And so if you just do good, respite of what everybody else does, uh, you will get your reward. And those who do evil, even though sometimes it seems like they are being successful, uh, certainly in their hearts or mind, they don't have the peace they would have with God. And they're missing out on the blessings they could have. They may be receiving some things they consider blessings, but what they really are missing out on that they don't even understand because they don't know him. So again, uh, God's judgment will be on all and uh, the human race completely. Verses 12 through 15. So all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin on the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but of those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by law, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show the requirements of the law written on their hearts, their conscience also bear witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. So we see here, going back to chapter 1, that all have sinned before God. But also, if you go all the way back to Genesis, we see that all mankind is created in the image of God. So there is uh, some goodness in us. We, we can do right sometimes. We never do perfectly right. But there, there are occasions where good people, bad people, will do good things. And of course, on the other hand, there are times where good people will do bad things. Uh, and before the law was ever given to mankind to point out specific things, people died. Uh, up until the time we have the Ten Commandments and laws thereafter, people still died in their sins because ultimately it's a heart issue that is revealed in actions and in speech. But the heart is still, the thoughts that are there are, are still wrong before God. It's a, a matter of disobedience. Although created in God's image, sometimes we would do good things. Uh, still ultimately, because of sin, we do not measure up to the standard that God says that we need to do. So the law is there to point out specific things, but that's not the only things that we do in disobedience to God. A lot of times it's our attitudes, a lot of times it's our heart, you know, thoughts in our mind that may not ever be seen by anybody else, but it's there nonetheless. And so our goal certainly is to do as much good as possible because created in the image of God and Christians, uh, the word Christian means little Christ, as we claim that as our title, when we obviously do things that are wrong before mankind, it, it, it shames God. It's like, it's like taking God's name in vain. And so we certainly want to, do want to be bad examples. We want to be as good as we can because we reflect who God is and who Christ is in our life and that we have changed and that more potential to do good than ever before because of him in, in our lives. And so that's where we are. Now, the last verse here says, this will take place about the judgment on the day when God will judge man's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So in other words, 
there's going to be a judgment day when you die and go before heaven and, and uh, Christ will stand before the Lord and say, uh, forgive them, I have accepted their sins upon me because they have accepted me. And so, so God will, will let us go, but he will also know about all the things that you have ever done. And so, not quite sure how all that plays out as far as you being seeing those things, because the Bible also te says he forgives your sins from east to west. But I'm not so, if you don't repent of a sin, I'm not so sure that that would not be shown to you, even though uh, ultimately you'll be judged righteous because of Christ. But there may be a time when you're not, we're not going to be real happy because of, of the things we have seen. Uh, uh, all that will play out in heaven, and I'm not going to guarantee you one way or another about whether I'm right or wrong on that. Well, because of these passages, then, let's go ahead and look at our points to ponder here. And uh, we must remember that all the human race, including us, are sinners and guilty of judgment. And that because your family may have been Christian, uh, that does not give you a guarantee that you're all right. Each person must make their own individual decision before God. And so this is something we need, we need to do. Uh, accept Christ individually. Not just because your family did it, grandparents did it, you must do it yourself. Now, the next thing is it's not wrong to point out, uh, I'm beginning to wonder if I got the right points to ponder up here. So, well, maybe I do not have the right ones, but we, we will see. Uh, I will continue on with, with maybe what I have here. Let me just check something real quick, see if I can find the right one. Ah, I think I have them in the backwards place. So, so here we go. There we go. We must remember all of us are human beings uh, are sin as a guilty of judgment. That's the point I really want to make. He goes back and talks about that, about the judgment. We all have no excuse. We must do what is right. Now, the next thing is, it's not wrong to point out the sins of other people. As the Bible lists those things. The, the goal is to get them to do right, to be reconciled with God, to walk according to Him. Uh, but we are hypocrites if we do the very same things we're telling them, uh, and we make up excuses for what we're doing, uh, and saying that my sin is less than your sin. Well, no, if you're doing the same thing, the may, circumstances may be different, but the sin is still a sin. So we have to be careful with that, to not do those things. Next, the, the knowing how to act because of the law ought to make us better behave, but, but sometimes we aren't. So in other words, people who go to church all their life, study the Bible all their life, when they leave the building and go out and live in the world, sometimes, even though they know things they should do or shouldn't do, they end up doing the wrong things and not doing the right things. Both are sin. To know to do right and not doing it is also incorrect. And so here we have this situation that uh, studying is good, but application is, is the key point about it. It doesn't make any difference if you're a scholar on what the Bible says if you're not living that life. The devil probably knows more scriptures than all the rest of us, but certainly he is not uh, attuned to doing those things that are right. He's disobedient to all those things, but he knows it. There are a lot of scholars today in colleges that know all about the Bible, could quote it probably better than you are. A lot of atheists could quote it better than you and I, but it doesn't mean that they're saved through the blood of Christ. It doesn't mean they're obeying uh, what they know that the Bible says to do. The next point would be there that knowing how to act because a lot it really ought to make us better, but it doesn't mean we will. It really ought to. We ought to be better people. People ought to be excited about hiring a Christian at work because we will work harder than anybody else. We will honor the boss more than anybody else. We'll be totally honest. We we'll give our best effort. That's that's what ought to happen. Uh, but again, knowing how we should be doesn't necessarily mean that is how we are. So I hope that would be the case for you and I that we will strive to bear and bear and bear, exemplify Christ and, and God's behavior wherever we are. Uh, next point is that all this is still boils down to a heart problem. You cannot live a perfect life anyway. But even if you, quote, could, if your heart isn't right, you did not accept the Christ into your heart, there's, there's still a hole there that, that can, is not filled and God will not count you righteous. Because all your deeds are like filthy rags before him, all your good deeds, and nobody will ever live a perfect life. And, you know, one sin would cause you to, to not be acceptable in God's sight. 
It's a little bit like if you were trying to go to, to the moon and you, you were off in your direction by just a little bit in your start. By the time you get there, you'd be so far off you missed the moon completely. And that's the way it is with our relationship with God. Except through Christ, it's the only way we are accepted as righteous before him. And then the last one is, is to stay right with God in your acts and in your attitude. And we desire peace in this world. And I think that is determined more than anything else by knowing that God has approved the way we live. And so the book of Philippians, Paul writes this in chapter 4, I think it's a great passage of scripture. He loved the Philippians people, a uh, great relationship with them. But he gives this advice to them to keep them on the right path and, and to give you peace in this world. So let me read to you of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice now. When God repeats things often in the Bible, but here in the same verse, he talks about that our goal is that all the things that go on around us, we can keep rejoice in the Lord. Circumstances may not be good, but we can rejoice in who the Lord is and that Christ is our Savior. He lives within us. It says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. Again, your actions. The Lord is near, and he is always around us. So do not be anxious about anything. That doesn't mean don't be concerned, but don't be anxious. Don't be overwrought. Don't think God can't handle it. Uh, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Thankful that we're alive. Thankful for our salvation. Thankful for God can handle what's fixing to happen next. As he's handling what's happening now, always be thankful. And we present our requests to God. doesn't mean we don't recognize that there are issues, but we present those to God Again, he is the one that's going to help us move through these things or solve them for us. It says, verse 7 says, In the peace of God, which trans all understand will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says, to continue to be able to do this, here's, here's some, some advice to you. He says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so this is a goal for us. You can focus on the negative, and you can focus on the positive. Uh, the old story about is your glass half empty or half full is truly true. What you focus on will help you move on in your direction. You can be better, you can be bitter. So always focus on the good things that, that God has done, good things that God is doing, the good things that God has promised us for the day's head. And if you do that, you'll have peace in the midst of a very troubled world. Because indeed, we are in a very troubled world today. So let me pray for us. And I hope that give you, God will continue to give you peace, even as you seek peace, the way through the advice that he has given us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. And we know that we are going to be judged uh, for our life that we've lived here. And our salvation is only through Christ. We desire to be as righteous and as holy as possible. Although we know we fall short, but help us to more that, that which we know to do, let us do. Let us repent when we've done wrong. And certainly help us to help other people by point out errors in their life, too. But for the goal of reconciliation, not for lifting us up above them. Because we know truly, Lord, that that's not the way it ought to be. Our, we are equal before the cross, sinners all, and salvation given to all. And so as we all are your creation, Lord, let us appreciate those who are around us and help them. And so, Father, I pray also for, for all of us that we continue to focus on you and the good things you have done in the past and the present and hope for the future, that we might have that kind of peace of mind. That we might give other people peace and hope in this world because a great many people uh, live in turmoil and are looking for peace. And we know that that empty hole of their heart can only be filled through Jesus Christ no matter what else they do. It will be sufficient for Christ in our hearts as we continue to turn uh, to him and do the things he wants us to do. And revel in, revel in, the, in the promises he has given us and the hope for the future. And we can have that peace. So Lord, I pray that peace will be upon these others even as I pray for it for myself. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. We look forward to continuing in the book of Romans next week so we'll pick up in chapter 2.